let's see. Good afternoon, uh, good evening rather everyone. Sorry, I'm used to doing these in the afternoon if you can't tell. <laughs> My name is Rebecca. I am the Director of Outreach Marketing and Events for Wild Care Cape Cod. As a reminder, Wild Care is a nonprofit organization and we rehab wild animals right here on the Cape in East Ham, Massachusetts. For those of you joining us out of state, that is sort of roundabouts here on our elbow. Um, you can find us online at wildcarecapecod.org if you'd like to learn a little bit more. If you'd like to make a donation, we are a donation-run organization. And if you'd like to give us a few hours of your time, we are actually looking for volunteers. However, tonight is not about wild care. Tonight is about a very important subject. Poisons are not the animal. Answer, raptors are the solution. And we are joined this evening by an expert, Gary Menon of Raptors Are the Solution, the Massachusetts chapter. I'm gonna share his URL and a little bit more information in our chat. Please remember that you guys are all on mute. You can ask questions throughout this presentation and I will field them to Gary for you right in that chat function. And we will be recording this so you'll be able to watch it again on our YouTube. So without further ado, I will turn you guys all over to Gary's capable hands. So welcome Gary Menon of the Massachusetts chapter of Raptors Are the Solution. Thank you very much. I am trying to share my screen now. Let me know if it's working. My screen is shared. Um, please let me know if it's working. Not quite yet. It is, okay. Um, no, not yet. Well, not yet, okay. No. Nope. I thought I shared it. Let's see. Okay, I'll try, I'll do, try this again, hold on. Okay. There it is. Okay, is it, is it it's, it's there? Yes. Okay, yep, great. I see it, thank you so much. And thank you for having me this evening to talk about uh, poison is not the solution. Uh, here is some information on me. My name is Gary Menon, as, as I was introduced. I live in Sterling, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, I'll leave this, I'll, uh, I'll return to this slide at the end of the presentation uh, for information on how to get a hold of me, get in touch with me with my email and phone number. I, I kind of want to start this presentation off tonight, uh, you know, that, that uh, once upon a time, how did I come to be at this place in time here in September um, 8th uh, at this time? It was actually an unfortunate event but hopefully something I'm, I'm now turning into a fortunate event. When my brother and I, about 60 years ago, when I was 10 years old, were at the top of our street uh, walking along, and we found a great horned owl that had been hit by a car. And uh, we, were, we were both, me especially, were, were fascinated, by, fascinated by this creature and um, took a great interest in it. And I uh, saved up some money at, at the time it was twelve dollars and fifty cents, nineteen sixty dollars, which is quite a bit in today's dollars actually, um, to, to have this bird mounted. And so we had it mounted, and uh, it's still in the family to this day. But it was a motivation for me to look into birds of prey, great horned owls in particular. Particular, and I, at the time about ten years old, read my first my first book, my first book cover to cover, which was about Ubo the great horned owl by the authors John and Jean George who also were environmental writers and, and uh, on different types of animals and also wrote the book, My Side of the Mountain, which has been an inspiration to a number of environmentalists uh, along the way. Uh, as I said, they, uh, the, the bird inspired me to look into raptors even further and uh, whether it's great horned owls, bald eagles, peregrine falcons or, or, or red-tailed hawks, uh, I'm just fascinated by them. They, they, to me, are the epitome of freedom in grace, and uh, to this day, I, if I see one that's soaring in the sky, and I'll stop the car to, to take a look at it. Um, now, a, a few decades later, actually about six de decades later, or a little bit less than that, I had re new was newly retired, and uh, I was at my daughter's house because I was hired as a de facto uh, daycare provider because I was the only one newly retired in the family. 
and she needed someone to watch over her, my two grandchildren who are up here on the left. And uh, I was over their house doing this chore um, and noticed there in their house, they had a box of, uh, of decon, just like, just like shown in the picture here. And uh, I found it and I was, you know, I didn't really know much about it other than it's, it scared me. I knew it was poison. And I was concerned right away that, you know, we had children in the house and pet my grand dogs as well as the grand cat. And, uh, you know, what if they got into these things? And so I was very concerned about it. And so I, especially with my, my daughter and son-in-law, they are, you know, they're very environmentally friendly. They, they are 100% organic insofar as possible. And if I were to be remiss and take them to McDonald's and uh, have them eat some French fries, they'd get on my case. So I thought this was quite a dichotomy that, that they would have this, this poison in their house. And so I started to do a little research on it. And son of a gun, I found that children, in fact, are poisoned quite regularly by these, um, these, these types of poisons, which uh, rodent poisons, which people in their house. And, and thousands of calls come into the CDC from parents who are concerned that their children had just ingested some poison. So children indeed are victims of this. And I convinced them very forthwith to, uh, to get rid of this. And that was a quick success. But doing more research, I found that pets as well can be affected by these uh, rodenticides. And it's one of the more, com more common calls coming to the poison hotlines uh, in veterinarian locations uh, throughout the country when pets are being poisoned by these uh, left out bait traps. And finally, the most compelling story that I came across uh, was the story which was published in the February 2013 Audubon magazine, which uh, was basically a recounting of the observation of Dr. Maureen Murray of the Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine in Grafton, Massachusetts, as she was reviewing necropsy photos of raptors that had succumbed to poisons here in Massachusetts, not very far from where I live here in Sterling. And uh, I'll quote from the story here on the slide. She was doing a good job of keeping her emotions under wraps as she clicked through the autopsy photos of dead hawks and owls. But the author was watching her eyes and as well as her computer screen and they revealed the anguish. And really that this story is about the anguish and the anguish which I felt as I read the story as well. There was the red-tailed hawk with a hematoma that had ballooned its left, left eye to 10 times normal size, with a great horned owl with a hematoma running the length of its left wing. The saddest of all was a red-tailed hawk with an egg. The well-developed blood vessels in her oviducts had ruptured and she had slowly bled, bled to death from the inside. Various raptors with pools of blood under the skin and each image was sadder than the last each and every one a horribly cruel death, and each was a victim of anticoagulant rodenticides used by exterminators, farmers, and homeowners. Um, as I continued my research, the, 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 the statistics and the data are never ending. Um, if you put in the search bar, hawks, owls, rats, and poison, you'll come up with any multiple thousands of hits, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, up to a million hits that I've seen on this issue. Some of the more interesting ones most recently that strike home was in the, the uh, winter of 2017, 2018, nine snowy owls died here in Massachusetts, some of which were in, on Cape Cod in that, over that winter. Now these, I've never even seen a live snowy owl in the wild. They're spectacular birds and to have nine of them visiting us from the Arctic coming down here and getting poisoned to death, to me is just, you know, just very anguishing as, as the word is. Um, another interesting fact was, uh, as Ma Maureen Mori had told me, that not a single autopsy great horned owl that they receive at Tufts has proven to be free of rodenticides when, it, when they've done an analysis of their liver. So it's a, it's a, it's a far-reaching problem, certainly here in Massachusetts and across the country. Now, the, one of the more potent rodenticides is this, is this uh, ingredient called brodificum which was accidentally discovered when cows and cattle were eating spoiled sweet clover hay, which was causing fatal hemorrhaging within that, the cattle. 
so they investigated and discovered this chemical called Rodificum, and uh, it, the benef one benefit that had developed from it was that it's a blood thinner, not beneficial from my perspective as far as wildlife is concerned, but beneficial because it's also used as a blood thinner in humans for people that have cardiac issues requiring blood thinners. And most all second generation, they call them second ge generation rodenticides, um, use brodificum or some form thereof to, uh, to do the poisoning. And any number of these um, ro rodenticides that you find on the market today, whether it's decon or mouse bait or rodentex, it contain brodificum or some of these other anticoagulants. And these, these particular anticoagulants um, are actually first, in, first to take kills. They don't require long buildup times. Just one dose tends to kill the animal. Um, there's another group of rodenticides called first generation rodenticides, which were developed before the second generations, which which are still in use today. In fact, they're both, both forms, both the first and second generations are in use today. The first generations require multiple intakes by the rodent before they succumb. And in certain ways, these are more da dangerous to the, to, the, uh, the, to the raptors and other wildlife because they, they, they uh, are still active as they're succumbing to the poisoning and as they're out there looking for water to, to satisfy their thirst, which these blood thinners cause them to have great thirst for water, then they're taken up by the, the hawk or the owl and the owl then succumbs as well. Um, here on the, on the left of the screen there, left center, is a bait trap. And this is a, this is a bait trap that I bought. And you may see these around if you, if you go to restaurants or anywhere you see dumpsters uh, stored. You may see some of these around dumpsters. And of course, these are particularly dangerous because they're out there in the environment the entire time. And uh, they also are a problem for contamination of the environment itself because water gets into them and they contaminate the water and the water gets into the soil and all the other life around that. So how these poisons work, the rodent eats the bait, the poison makes the rat thirsty, he, he, that, that rodent starts to bleed internally, the weakened rodent seeks out water, it's an easy target for the predator and the predator dies of internal injury, injury, internal bleeding or drowns trying to cure its thirst. Again, here's a picture of a bait box that I just showed you, and you can find, commonly find them around restaurants or other eating establishments and around dumpsters. And none of these, these stories are, um, are, as I said, these stories are never ending. This was a, a bald eagle poison in Cape Cod last, I think it was last October. Um, and uh, from Cape Ann to Cape Cod, there's been recent poisonings, both these poisonings, one of a red-tailed hawk the other of a great horned owl occurred just over a year ago now. So they, they, uh, these stories pop up from time to time, actually fairly frequently. Now this is an interesting sideline, a little diversion here, but um, now that, that marijuana uh, is, you know, is a recreational le legality here in, in, in Massachusetts, um, and, but people, some people are still you know, synthesizing fake um, fake marijuana, synthetic marijuana. And uh, oddly enough, in some of these illegal establishments, they use these blood thinners, these rodenticides in the mix because apparently it provides a greater high. Doesn't seem very uh, sensible to me, but apparently it's, it's actually happening here in the country. Um, now there's a, there's a myth out there um, and which was helped which Wildcare uh, actually helped me correct was the issue of second generation uh, anticoagulant rodenticides. It was understood that these had largely been banned except for use by professionals. And my understanding was it was they were only used insofar as existing stocks had been depleted, but that's not the case. And I, I took this to task and I actually ordered some of this off of Amazon. And the very next day I received an eight pound bag of brodificum based havoc here that you see this bag of, which, uh, which I had. And I, quick, I promptly returned it, but it proved to me and proved to, to everyone that in fact, you can buy, you can still buy these so-called banned 
second generation anticoagulant rodenticides. And that law actually was very misleading. It really didn't ban them. What it did was it required um, the retailers and the wholesalers to sell it in quantities no smaller than eight pounds, presuming that if they sold it only in eight pounds or larger, then at least it would cut out the residential market. But you know, if any resident wants to, any individual, not being a um, necessarily an exterminator, obviously, still can buy as much as they want of this stuff. And you can get it really quick, unfortunately, overnight by Amazon. Now I followed that up with a, uh, with a review. And my review was posted on August 10th this year. And uh, my review started out, these poisons kill unintended wildlife, rodenticides cause non-target organism death, be internal hemorrhaging, et cetera. And uh, I got a quick response from Amazon that uh, thanked me for submitting my review, but they rejected the review. For, for, and I, I can understand why they did that, but nonetheless, I gave it a shot. Yeah, so where, where are we heading with all this? Well, we, the, 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 the statistics are, and the, the data and the results worldwide are very sobering, very scary. In March of 2018, this is not a raptor, but the last male white rhino expired. So we are seeing an extinction crisis that's going through the country, if not the world. And, uh, you know, it just begs the question, what legacy are we leaving for? Our children and our grandchildren. That's, you know, that's my concern. Being, you know, being an older individual, I'm concerned about the children and the grandchildren. Uh, this this uh, was a was a story published the last uh, two years ago, September. Uh, after analyzing the status of all 557 raptor species, biologists have discovered that 18% of these birds are threatened with extinction and fully 52% have declining global populations. So raptors in particular are, are, are threatened more than most birds. And so anything we can do to stop the poisoning will ultimately help these birds survive. These birds, raptors in particular and wildlife in general, they, they, they suffer all kinds of, of um, injuries from diseases, insecticides, window and vehicle collisions. They get shot, they get trapped, they run into razor wire, they get electrocuted from power lines. And many of these things we, we as individuals have limited ability to change. However, we can do something about poisoning. We can eliminate, we cannot, we can forego the use of poisons and we can certainly if any, any given individual or family or business stops using poisons, I'm convinced that some owl, some hawk, some eagle family will survive and we will have accomplished something. Now, the other thing about rodenticides is they, with rodents, you know, they're prolific breeders and rodents tend to evolve quickly, far more quickly than our raptors. You know, here's a, here's a, a picture of, uh, of this, this situation where a great horn, horned owl clutch, lucky if they get two per year, and only 50% of them typically survive the years. That's one per year that may survive, whereas the rodents breed thousands in a year, and they can adapt to these poisons. So ultimately, you need stronger and stronger poisons, and the, the effect is certainly counterproductive on the, on the raptors. So again, how did I how did I get here? How did I get here this evening? Well, I became very concerned about this long before I learned of the organization Raptors Are the Solution, and I stopped. I started to write editorials to uh, actually letters to the editor, LTEs, to every newspaper in the area that I could find, and some of these news newspapers, fortunately for us, for me, they started. Publish these, publishing these as editorials, full page editorials. And this one was in our local paper here in Sterling, Massachusetts, which serves five towns. Um, the landmark, which was published uh, when I started this in February of 2018. So I, I started writing these stories and it became noticed by this organization called raptorsarethesolution.org. And they contacted me and asked me if I'd like to be the director of the, of the Massachusetts chapter, you know, a, a chapter of one, me. 
So I, I said, great, that, I'd be happy to do that. And I'd love to spread the word because I was, I was almost embarrassed by this. I, I was you know, 68 years old at the time and I really didn't know this was such a problem. And I, you know, was, I considered myself a de facto environmentalist and nonetheless, I didn't know this was such a serious problem. I quickly talked to my daughter and son-in-law about this and they stopped using it in, with this research. Uh, I, I was rather embarrassed uh, at, to, to learn that I thought that all this, I thought all this stuff had been solved by Rachel Carson years ago. At about, the, about the time that I found that first grade horned owl and DDT was the thing back then. But nonetheless, it's, it's still going on. It's still a problem, a big problem. <clears throat> but what are the things we can do? Well, as they say, you can, you can think globally, but you really have to act locally. We didn't save the right rhino, unfortunately, but we can save individual raptor families and other wildlife families. So how do we do this? Well, we can write letters to the editor. We can write to our legislators. We can donate to the rats organization. And as we collect money, we uh, put billboards up. And this particular billboard, um, similar to this billboard, we had two posted here in Massachusetts, one on, on uh, 128 North um, in, in, Lynn, in Linfield and the other out of, out of Fall River, we had one posted for a while. And these things tend to promote awareness. Uh, I had tried to start a ballot initiative to try to get these, these poisons banned outright. However, um, the results of that were rather discouraging in that I wrote up the initiative, I submitted it to the Attorney General's office. They wrote back to me and indicated that I needed to incorporate this, all the Massachusetts general laws and code of Massachusetts regulations at the time by August of last year. So I would have to do the legwork. And even at that point in time, that was not what scared me so much, was the fact that even if they approved it, I would then need to collect 60,000 statewide signatures by the year, by November of 2019, in order to get it on November 2020's ballot. So I begged off on that. I just did not, I individually just couldn't see that happening. I'd still like to see that happen, um, but it would take a lot more volunteers than than what we currently have that are willing to do this and get involved with this. I thought this was no different than the leg hole trap initiative that, that was passed several years ago. So I didn't see why it would be such a big deal. However, because rodenticide manufacturers, the extermination business is very powerful. They have, they, have a, they have a lot of money and they can influence legislators, they can lobby and they can put a lot of money behind this and they will put a lot of money behind this. So that's why the initiative would need to have far more involvement than, than, than me alone, than I alone could, uh, could handle. However, I'm not, even at this point, I'm not uh, putting this completely away. I still think it's, it's something viable if I can get the organization behind it. I, I guess I, I think I need, that, uh, I need that, that mover and a shaker. I need that celebrity to get behind this thing in order to uh, kind of like, uh, the, uh, the band leader from the Eagles um, got behind the Walden Woods. That's something we could, we could if we could get a person like that to, uh, to support this initiative, that would certainly jumpstart it. But anyways, I've kind of backed off, backed off of that. And uh, I'm, I'm addressing things that the, the attendees to this, this, um, this video can do right now. Obviously, you please don't use poison. Please encourage others around you spread the awareness not to use poison. And if you have to hire a pest control company, you can, you can dictate to the pest control company that you want them not to use poisons. And I've located a number of these pest control companies that have agreed that they would not use poisons upon you know, the, uh, the customer request. Um, notice that uh, there's a picture of a red-tailed hawk here, unfortunate picture of a red-tailed hawk because this red-tailed hawk is eating the entrails of a rodent. And you notice the, the blue-green coloring of the entrails um, of this rodent that the red-tailed hawk is consuming. They're bluish in color. That's a clear giveaway that that, that rodent died of, if it didn't die, it was certainly going to die of rodenticide poisoning because the, it's a marker when the exterminators and people that use them can determine that in fact that rodent died of rodenticide poisoning.
Unfortunately, this red-tailed hawk got a hold of it, and he'll probably, he'll probably has seen a similar fate. Now, the, from the exterminator's perspective, you know, they like to be like the cable guy. They like to come to your house or your, res your residence to your business, and they like to put out these, these bait, bait boxes. They basically take a bait box, they, they put it by your dumpster, they put it by a location where they, they see the rodents uh, entering or exiting the house, and they come back in another 30 days and replace it. It's minimal manpower and manpower which which really you know controls the cost of the of the effort because the labor costs are so high so uh, they have a captured audience like they have a captured audience and come back month after month and unfortunately this cycle is uh is continuous and as you put more rodent bait out there you get more rodents and simultaneously cutting down on their natural predators which is the which is the double whammy of course now <clears throat> There's another reason not to use poisons having nothing to do with raptors. And that is because imagine one, a rodent uh, in your house, say if you were to have even mice in your house, and, and I commonly get mice in my house about this time of the year. Every year, mice want to get into the house. They're looking for a place that's warm or maybe they can find a food source. And uh, if I were to put up poison bait traps for these mice, where do the mice go? Well. They go outside, get consumed by a, a raptor. That's certainly not, nothing that I want to see happening. But even if they don't go outside, they'll find a they'll find a place to, to which in which to die. And usually that's behind a wall somewhere. So you're likely to find an, a very a nefarious odor coming from your walls because these mice have crawled in the crawl spaces and behind walls behind a sheetrock and have died, which presents another problem. So it's another reason not to use poisons. What are the alternatives? Well, an indoor house cat. I think they're very effective. Keep your, ha keep your house cat indoors. Don't let them out. That's their, gonna be their life because if they get out, they, they can kill an awful lot of wildlife, which they don't need to be killing because you're, you're keeping them well fed. Um, but don't keep them too well fed if you keep them in a the house because you want them to be a little bit hungry to, if they should see a mice, mouse walk by. So they keep that hunting instinct and keep those mice in check. And my cat, that's my cat right there. And she catches uh, on the order of two or three mice every winter season. And so I will always have a cat in the house. But even though I also use these sudden death snap traps, these are also quite effective. Um, they're sudden death usually, and which is, you know, which is humane. There's other traps like this radicator electronic trap. Um, there's repellers, ultrasonic repellers, like shown in the center right of the screen and I have one here and I have it plugged in and you can see it and uh, you can see the light on the side indicating it's active. Now I cannot sense anything about the ultrasonic signal that's being emitted by this this device. As far as I know, <laughs> just looking at it, it might be just an LED that's lit up and I've been had. But um, I've tried them in my, my, uh, my outbuilding where I have a, a boat stored and uh, so I keep it on the, actually I keep it right on the boat and I plug it into a 110 volt source, an extension cord. And so far it's, I, I believe they're very effective. Um, I used to, prior to this time, use just the snap traps, the snap traps, which uh, invent a better mouse trap. That's what, what's around, you can get these in packages of, of eight at your local hardware store. And I had been using those and I continue to use them kind of as a check on these ultrasonic repellers. And since I've used the ultrasonic repellers, the catches in the snap traps have gone way down. And I haven't seen any damage to upholstery or any wiring in my boat or car that I store there since I've used the ultrasonic repellers. So I, I think they're particularly effective from my personal experience, though people have told me that kind of like, you know, the air, airplanes at, at uh, airports, over time, the, uh, the animals get used to them and then they, they ignored them. That hasn't happened to me yet. Um, there are live traps where you can relocate the rodents. Um, you can use carbon dioxide pellets if you can locate the rodent belt burrows where, where you take these pellets. And I do have sources for these pellets that are available at reasonable costs. You stuff these pellets, these CO2 pellets, they're dry ice. Handle them carefully because they will cause frostbite if you don't have the proper gloving. You stuff them down the rodent burrows 
you try to find the other entrances and exits and block them off, the, um, the carbon dioxide evaporates and it will suffocate the rodents under, underground. It's not the most humane way, but at least it's not poisoning them and it protects the wildlife. Finally, there's this device in the center bottom, which is called the A24 Auto Trap. And uh, this was provided to me by the company which makes them. And basically what happens is that the rodent sees this, this device, he smells the device because in the top of this auto trap is the bait. It's an odorous bait which is intended to, to attract the rodent. So the rodents are very curious usually and they'll, they'll crawl along in this area of the trap and they'll try to go into this area. And I'm careful not to stick my finger in there because it's charged with a CO2 cylinder. And uh, if I were to stick my finger in it, it would snap shut and probably break my finger. But it's intended for the rodent to put its head in there, designed small enough so that nothing larger than a rat can get in there. And it's hit with a plunger, which, which kills it instantly. And it drops away from the, from the trap. And when it drops away from the trap, dead, it can be taken away by other, other uh, scavengers, unless of course it's in your house and then you wanna take it away on your own. So it's, it's, it's really the ideal trap. It, it's self-baiting, it's self-setting, um, it's self-clearing. It has all these advantages that most other traps don't have. And, and you don't have to have an electrical supply. You have to have a carbon dioxide cylinder. You see here at the bottom of the trap and you change that once every six months. And it, it's uh, supposed to be guaranteed for up to 24 kills, 24 actions for the life of that CO2 cylinder. I mean, if you haven't had 24 kills in six months, then you should replace the cylinder anyways, because I guess they get depleted over time. And right now they're only, you know, usable for, for the uh, six month period. So th there are a few other things that you can do. There's these Actually, homemade- Actually, I'm gonna jump in for just one second. We do have a question on that last slide. The okay. ultrasonic device, does it impact any household pets? Like you said, you have a cat. Do you notice? I, I was concerned about that. And uh, actually, I'm still concerned about that. So I don't use it in my house. I use it in an outbuilding in my house where I don't have any pets. Because yes, I was concerned about that. According to the manufacturer, it doesn't affect them, but I don't know how that can be. Because uh, I thought that, you know, dogs respond to dog whistles, high ultrasonic frequencies. And so I'm not bought yet on that. So my 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 preventative action on that is to not use them inside where I have a pet. That's what I do personally. I use them in my outbuilding where I, my boat is stored. And uh, for that very reason. Again, here are some, here are some other uh, homemade type devices. These are walk to plank type of devices. They're not a very pleasant, you know, I, I like the, the devices which are, which are instantaneous kill, the most humane type. These, these drown the creature. I just don't, don't like that idea. Um, but and there are other things which you can repel them. Uh, I've never used this peppermint, but I'm told it's a great, very benign repellent, which doesn't harm anything. And you can put it outside. Mothballs, they do work, but you're cautioned to, to only use them in an, an enclosed area, which no children can, um, or pets can access and that you can retrieve them after you're done, say for the winter season. I'll put some canisters of them on my boat as well as having that ultrasonic protector and to keep a double belt and suspenders approach, but make sure that I recollect them every spring. So you don't wanna use them outside. They can contaminate groundwater, I'm told, um, even though the, the action is that they evaporate but the evaporation gas is heavier than air and it tends to go down rather than up. I've never tried this botanical rodent repellent. I don't know its effectiveness. I have tried to bounce, these bounce dryer sheets. They've been, they've been um, advertised to me by people who've used them as very effective keeping rodents out of stored vehicles in garages. However, I've tried them. And in fact, I'd set some bounce dryer sheets in the engine compartment of a vehicle I stored and there were the rem remnants of, uh, of some acorns, which apparently a chipmunk or a mouse had been eating on top of the bounce sheet. So that rodent was using it as like a picnic table cloth. 
So I wouldn't suggest using them. I don't think they really are effective based on that experience. Now these, these things, these glue traps, these are terrible. I, I don't know why these aren't just banned outright. Um, you know, the birds and other animals get caught in them. They, they have a horrific death and they tend to attract, you know, if a, if a bird gets caught or rodent gets caught into them, then a screech owl flies by and it tries to, to attack the bird that's caught in the glue trap and then they get caught. So I wish these were just, just just like rodenticides were banned, but that's one of my wishes that uh, it's not gonna come true unless we keep spreading the awareness of not using these sort of things and the more people that don't use them, it will be a supply and demand thing when these things just aren't moving off the shelves and that way it'll be a natural death to these products. Here's an interesting, um, method. It's called Cenotec, Cenotec, Contrapest, and it's intended to be a birth control for rodents. You actually feed the rodents this bait, which tends to change their ovulation cycle, just like a birth control pill. And so it tends to reduce their population. Now, in the city of Somerville, here, right here in Massachusetts, they used these in May of about five years ago, and they actually noted significant reduction in the rodent population as a result of using these contrapest products. Now, I've been assured by the inventor, the developer of this product, that it does not have any secondary birth control effects on any birds of prey or other animals that tend to eat it. However, in my own opinion, it's a chemical. And if it's causing the birth control on the rodent, now, why wouldn't it tend to cause birth control on the raptors that are consuming those rodents that have been ingesting these birth control products? They assure me that doesn't happen. I guess I offer this is better than using poisons, but I would prefer people use other methods that we've also already talked about and other methods that I haven't talked about yet to control their rodent problem. You know, first, first and foremost, you know, if you keep your own stoop clean, the whole world will be clean. And that's the biggest problem. People are not picking up after themselves. If you've got a rodent problem, you usually probably have a way that the rodents are getting in, even with my mice, they're getting in somehow. We've got to try to look for where those places are. But mice can get in almost any small, you know, just a, a centimeter diameter hole that can somehow get themselves through. Rats, not so much. But they too can get into most any place. And what you need to do is keep your area clean, keep the trash picked up, keep it, keep it in tamper, re, you know, rodent proof containers. And in Revere, another city in Massachusetts, they actually spent on the order of close to a million dollars two years ago, providing every tax paying resident with a rodent proof trash container. And they, they, required, they, they provided them and they required them to use them. And how did they require them to use them? Well, they wouldn't pick up trash unless they used these containers that they provided. And that's really part of what they call integrated pest management. Taking all these other actions prior to using methods of kill or, or direct elimination to get rid of the problem before it becomes a problem. Ultimately, what's the goal here? The goal is to you know, use our raptors. Raptors are the solution because these raptors just are consummate consumers of these rodents. Um, this particular bird in front of us, unfortunately, has been nearly extirpated from Massachusetts, the barn owl. Um, they are just great mousers and, and ratters. They will eat hundreds of these rodents every, every couple of months. One red-shouldered red hawk found here in Massachusetts can consume on the order of 30 rodents in a single month, probably more if they have young to feed. This is a, an example of how many rodent, you know, remains or remnants are found underneath a barn owl, best, barn owl nest in Richmond, California. As you see, they pile up. As, as you may know, raptors, especially owls, they uh, regurgitate the non-digestibles, the hair, and the skeletal remains, they regurgitate these in a, felt, in a pellet. The pellet is, you know, kind of burped overboard. Outside the nest, they fall to the ground and they can be collected and analyzed and they build up over time, just showing the effectiveness of 
of barn owls and other owls for rodent control. So, as I said, raptors are the solution. We want raptors to have the solution and to be the solution. We have to learn to coexist with them. We have to learn to coexist with wildlife. We have to give them some space. The biggest, the biggest threat to wildlife almost anywhere is loss of habitat. And whether it's you know wild turkeys or raptors or deer or bear or any other wildlife, it's the, the loss of habitat. Thousands of acres in Massachusetts are lost almost every day here in Massachusetts. So we have to learn to coexist or somehow control our population better. Uh, here's just an example of someone learning to coexist with the turkeys. The turkey has stopped traffic there in, a, in the, in the left-hand left lane, allowing the, his brood to go across, to his heron to go across. We need to have, start coexisting with wildlife. How do we coexist with wildlife? Well, if we can coexist with them by not using poisons, they will coexist with us, even in highly urban environments. And one way you can do this is putting up nest boxes. At the, at the bottom center is a nest box for a screech owl. They're, they're common in Massachusetts. The middle one is for barn owls, barred owls. And the top one is for a barn owl. Uh, barn owls and barred owls will nest in the same type of box. You can also put up, put up raptor perches in your yard to allow them a, a vantage point from which to, to watch your yard for rodents to scurry around. And they will perch on these in the open and then use them as staging points for their catching of the rodents that scurry about your yard. Just a couple of ways we can coexist. So in summary, again, picture here to the upper right is a barn, barn owl, which have been largely eliminated in Massachusetts. Um, they used to exist in reasonable numbers. I think they were always rare, but now I think they're pretty much extinct here. Uh, there's a great cost in terms of human health, mortality, pets and wildlife and environmental de degradation, create rat resistant, rat rodent resistant uh, population to the poison. We destroy the predators, as I've been saying. And there's the unknown of what are the long term effects from partial poisoning. We, we, we have seen in, the, in previous slides there at uh, at the Grafton Wildlife Center, the rehab center, of how many raptors they, they come upon that have been poisoned to death. But what about those raptors that haven't been poisoned to death? They've been, been poisoned partially. How does that affect their longevity? Are they dying later after the poison has left their bodies but has an impacted their, their, um, their resistance to other diseases and other threats? That is an unanswered question. And I think it's a, it's a serious question. You know, if I think if you find one poison raptor that's been poisoned to death, there are probably 10 others that have been poisoned to death that you haven't found. As you know, the raptors are our apex predators. So it, it, from that alone, you can tell what happens when you eliminate an apex predator. Well, the other, pred the other animals below them tend to proliferate. Now, this is an interesting food web slide. And at the very bottom of the slide is one of these bait boxes. And this bait box contaminates all these creatures. Re uh, rodenticide residues have been found in every single representation of plant or animal life shown on this web. Whether it's a plant, a caterpillar, a slug, they've all had evidence of rodenticide. So what's happening is these bait boxes are left outside, they're, they're placed where the exterminator or where the directions tell, me, tell you to place them outside. Water gets into them. They're soluble. Almost everything is soluble in water. Even the plastic itself is ultimately soluble in water over time. And these poisons get into the environment and into all these other creatures. So it's, it's far reaching and it's only going to get worse. Now here's something interesting for, for people in Massachusetts, which I learned becoming the director of the Raptors on the Solution in Massachusetts with my research. Here in Massachusetts, especially on Cape Cod, Lyme disease is a particular concern. I think everybody probably listening to this presentation and certainly you folks there on a the Cape know about Lyme disease. Hopefully you haven't contracted the disease. This year alone, I personally had two embedded ticks, two embedded deer ticks, which I had sent off to the UMass an an analyst laboratory, which came back to me as being carriers of Lyme disease. So I had simultaneous with with discovering the embedded ticks and removing them, I called my primary care physician and he 
forwarded me a prescription for some doxycycline, which I promptly took. And so far, knock on wood, I haven't uh, come down with Lyme disease. Um, but, and so they say, well, typically it's the deer tick on the deer, which is the vector for the transmission ultimately to humans. That the deer ticks fall off the deer, they get into your shrubbery, into your, your leaf litter, you're out there raking, which is what I was doing, and they get on your person and they infect you with Lyme disease. But it's actually the white-footed mouse, which is the main vector. And of course, the white-footed mouse is the main food of the barred owl, which is a common resident here in Massachusetts. So if you want to convince people not to use rodenticides, here's one method. The more rodenticides you use, the less, the less you'll have these barred owls to feed on these white-footed mice vectors of Lyme disease. Keep the owls, keep the, the white-footed mouse population in check. And hopefully we will eliminate or minimize Lyme disease as well. Well, I happen to be also a member of the uh, Sterling Board of Health at the present time. I've been a member of the Board of Health for about the last 10 years. And if there's any Board of Health members here on the presentation tonight, there's action you can take if you can convince your fellow members um, to get on board with these is for one, you can promote proactive measures, all the proactive measures that we've discussed so far in your town at the Board of Health level. You can use your authority on the Board of Health to require dumpster and garbage area cleanups. You can enforce those regulations that every Board of Health has. It's nuisance regulations relative to cleaning up of, of debris and garbage, which tend to be inv invites to rodents. You can also consider sponsoring a Warren article, banning rodenticides in your town. Now, I've tried this in my town. My fellow Board of Health members, uh, I was not able to convince them to buy onto this. They're concerned, their, their main concern is they want to follow the existing laws and regulations and don't want to know, don't, do not want to write new regulations. And some will say this is also, you know, not, not uh, tenable, will not stand the test of legal issue. Well, it has been done with glyphosates in at least one town, I think it's uh, Ware, Massachusetts, where they have banned it. Maybe it was not Ware, but it's a north central town which has banned glyphosates. Now it hasn't been tested in the courts and glyphosates are not rodenticides, but they are, they are, they are uh, herbicides, which are used to spray roadsides to uh, control the um, weed growth, which is very counterproductive as well. It can kill other things besides the weeds and uh, fortunately one town has attempted to ban them. You can, uh, the next thing is something we can do uh, the Raptors organization, is consider nominating a local business if you can convince them or any organization in your town, whether it be a condo complex, uh, a school, pu public or private, uh, um, an old age home, to stop using rodenticides and they can be nominated for the Owl Wise Leader Program. Now the Owl Wise Leader Program is, uh, show this picture, this is just, it's basically, again, an awareness program where if you get an organization to, to uh, sign on to becoming an Owlwise leader, what happens is that they agree to stop selling or using rat poisons of any kind. And any organization can do this. And when, when they agree to do this, you, you write them up. You get them noticed in, the, uh, in your local media, like we did here in Arlington at the Butternut Bakery in, in Arlington, Massachusetts this past spring actually a year ago this past spring, where they agreed not to use rodenticides. And we came there to the organization. In the center of the, the picture is the Diane Welsh, who is the, uh, the animal control officer for Ar Arlington. And she brought her great horned owl. That's a real live great horned owl on her, on her left arm there. And uh, that really attracted people as they're going by. And to see this spectacular bird of prey live there on the street in Arlington, and to the far right is the owner of the Butternut Bakery. And uh, we convinced them to not use poisons and we wrote this up in the local media there in, uh, I think Wicked Awesome Arlington and some other organizations there in Arlington. And, and hopefully this spread the word. We've had other organizations that have signed on to it as well. And uh, we're, it's another method to spread the word of not using rodenticides. Here, uh, this, it was interesting about the time I started this project when I discovered the 
the rodenticide at my daughter's house, you know, early 2018, same year that uh, that uh, National Geographic called 2018 the year of the birds. And there was an interesting quote in here, in that in that uh, magazine article, which quote unquote says, "If you take care of the birds, you take care of most of the problems of the world," which I thought was most compelling and very relevant. Well. What's my personal bar for success here? If I can convince just one person, one family, one business to, for, to forever forego the use of poisons and to carry that message to others, I believe that I've been a success and hopefully someone in this organization, in this audience tonight will, will become aware of the, the dangers posed by these uh, rodenticides. And uh, because awareness right now is our best, if not our only tool to spread the word and hopefully People will reflect this in their purchases at hardware stores. And as more and more of these products do not move off the shelves, the more and more of these products will be discontinued. I think that's our best hope at the present time. Because, uh, you know, it's been 60 years since I, you know, I, I found that, came upon that great horned owl. And uh, about 60 years ago, Rachel Carson had published Silent Spring. I thought those problems, of course, I was only 10 years old at the time, but I, it stuck in my mind because of, uh, you know, the, the, the popularity of the book Silent Spring, which ultimately led to Earth Day being declared about a decade later, that these problems had been solved, but clearly they haven't. And uh, begs the question, is rat poison the new DTT? And I think really it is at the present time. Okay, I can uh, take questions. Uh, this is a slide of how you contact me. I have my email at the bottom left and my phone number. If you do send me an email, um, I, my intent is to answer all emails. If you did not get an answer from me because you asked a question and I didn't answer, by all means, um, uh, send it again. My intent is to answer all emails. I commit to that. And so maybe it went into my uh, spam folder or, or some such thing, but I intend to answer all emails. And I offer myself, if anybody knows any, any other venue that would like to have this presentation presented either by me or yourself, I will share all these slides with everybody and anybody that wants to use them for their own presentation and uh, would be happy to do that. There's no, uh, there's no protective or, or copyrights here. Okay, with that, I'll take any questions. Great, Gary, thank you so much. So in addition to not using rodenticides, are there ways that people can help increase the raptor population? Well, you know, to, as I said, coexisting with them, use, using nest boxes, perches um, in their yards, depending on the size of their yard. But again, these, these raptors uh, can live in very, very urban environments. Arlington is an example. It's a very urban environment. It's right outside Boston. And uh, two of our two, recent uh, um, Owl Wise Leader Awards were, Arling were awarded to businesses in Arlington. One was, a, one was that uh, Butternut Bakery and the other was, an, was a condo complex. And in the particular is condo complex, in the middle of the condo complex, they had a red-tailed hawk nest. And by eliminating the rodenticides in the complex, they facilitated the use of those red tails to collect the rats. And in fact, I have a few pictures of the uh, red tail hawk that was taken and had had eaten several rats in that condo complex. So that's, you know, the ways that you can encourage the use or encourage the attraction of raptors to your neighborhood is certainly, first and foremost, don't use poisons. Let's not kill them if we invite them there. And secondly, invite them there by the use of net next boxes and via the use of uh, raptor purchase and also to raise awareness of their benefits to the environment and to the neighborhood. Um, let's see. This is an easy one. How does someone make a donation to Mass Rats? Well, they can just go to raptorsarethesolution.org and there's a separate page for Mass Rats. Um, and you can donate right at that page. Or if, if it, uh, I think, I think I'm, I'm, I have to stand corrected there. I think the, the donation is on the, the main page and you have to, you have to ask that it go to Mass Rats. And whereupon they will set that money aside for Mass Rats. Okay, that's easy enough. Um, so let's see, I think it's Jacqueline um, is hoping that you could, ooh, hold on, comment on what's going on in California. 
It says, it seems like we are on our way to banning secondary poisons through our state government rather than going through the ballot. But I don't re remember the details of how this started. Well, it went, it went to their legislature. It's been going through the legislature now for the better part of nine years. So it wasn't an easy process, even in a, a progressive a state as California. It's been, a, it's been a tiring, long, drawn out process. And it still hasn't gone over the goal line yet, but pretty close. They just need Gavin Newsom's signature at this point. Mm. Um, so Bobby actually asked about if you can rate things like poisons on Amazon without buying them. And that I actually do know the answer to. Uh, typically, you cannot. So people would have to buy the poison and then send it back and then rate it. Well, they, you know, as I said, I tried to uh, give them a, a bad rating mm -hmm. a review and they uh, wrote back to me and said they weren't going to publish it because you know, it wasn't too favorable for the sale of their product, you know, uh, which I can understand, but nonetheless, gave it a shot. I did learn something from that, thanks to Wildcare. Yes, I guess if we all started buying things and then sending them back very quickly, that might make them change their policy. That could be a, that could be a message for sure. Um, let's see, what else do we have? A lot of people are saying, thank you so much. This is incredibly informative. Um, let's see, Gail shared that they watched the wild birds owl cam this spring and eggs were laid and chicks were born and they watched them until they fledged. So if anybody's interested in that, you can actually Google it. Um, Where was that owl I, cam? Um, you know, I'll have to look it up and I can share it with everyone. I've seen it too. I think it's explore.org. There's, there's several, there's more than one out there. Yeah, they have, I think if you go to explore.org, they have cameras that they're networked with all over the planet. Um, but this particular one, I'm not quite sure. Let's see, Gary, do you do any outreach to local exterminators in an effort to educate alter alternatives to poisons? I've, I've not done that yet. I'm kind of apprehensive about doing that. In the, in the times I've talked with exterminators, you know, I, the best I could do was find out if they would be willing not to use poisons in any particular, you know, location. And, and the, I, I must have called about a dozen exterminators here in Central Massachusetts, the Sterling, Wachusett area. And of the dozen I called, only three would commit to not using poisons. But it was three. I mean, three would do it if that was your request. The cost might go up because, of course, you know, they just can't put that bait box out there and walk away. They have to take some active, they have to bait, they have to clear, they have to reset, those sort of things. I do know if anyone's interested here on the Cape, we do have a couple of companies that have gone all natural, partly because of our commitment to the watershed here. Um, and there are a couple of landscaping companies that also are committed to no longer using anything but natural solutions for grub and weed control as well. Um, so if you wanna email me, my email is events at wildcarecapecod.org. I'm happy to pass on that information to you. And if I don't know the answer and it's really a question for Gary, I'm happy to pass on your email to him as well. Let's see. Um, Francis is curious about the Audubon Society and if they have any interest or are involved in banning poisons. They certainly do have a very strong interest in that. Um, I've, I've spoken there on four separate occasions that they have, a, they have an owl event every fall around Halloween. And the last two years I've spoken there, uh, it's a Saturday, Sunday event. I've spoken both times, both days. They're very interested in it. Um, I haven't been able to hook them into becoming a motivator or a prime mover behind an actual ban because uh, most of people I've talked to are about trying to initiate a, uh, basically a law change, a ban, a, a regulatory change to our code of Massachusetts regulations. Um, it indicated it would take hundreds of thousands of dollars, the effort would be very, very costly, and it would be fought tooth and nail by the exterminating business. So they, they just not, are, are, at this point, are not guaranteed success, I guess, but um, I don't think it's something that you, you know, that we should give up on. I'm always keeping that in the back of my mind. So if you don't get anything else out of this, folks, don't give up. Don't stop trying, don't stop sharing the good word. Well, Lisa, uh, Lisa Owens Viani, who, is, who started this organization there in Berkeley, California, started this about almost a decade ago. 
And you know, she's been working at this tirelessly for almost a decade now. And uh, a lot of disappointments along the way. But slowly but surely, they are making ground. And they are spreading awareness across, across the country. I, I think I may, may have been the first chapter uh, separate from the California you know, headquarters. And since that time, I think they've got five chapters now across the country. So oh, that's um, great news. And, and, and relative to the Mass Rats chapter, if anybody wants to be more involved with it, you know, anybody like to be a co-director with me, by all means, um, I'll promote you right away. <laughs> so this is a good time for me to remind you that um, I will share the raptors are the solution.org again in our chat here if anyone wants to grab it i do want to mention um, when i was doing a little research before i met gary one of the things i was really impressed with is um, raptors are the solution.org offers coloring sheets so you can start educating the young people in your life um, there was bookmarks and all sorts of other things that you could download it's all totally free you can print it out at home and start some educated chats with kids and grandkids um, or if you're a teacher there's some great information on there if you want to start educating some of your students and it's all absolutely free it was an amazing resource for me i learned a ton and this was even before i got to chit chat with gary and i've learned a ton since then um, oh, we have a couple more questions here. Louisa says Massachusetts passed a referendum for a more humane treatment of farm animals in 2016, and they had an animal ag uh, agriculture lobbyist from all over the country oppose it. It can be done. Oh, that's good news. Yeah, that was that particular um, ballot initiative was sponsored by the Humane Society of the United States, among others. And I spoke to the, the local representative in Boston about that. They claim that that effort cost their organizations on the order of a million dollars. Oh my goodness. That's what I said. I, I couldn't believe it would cost that much, but um, that's what they indicated. Um, Patrick is wondering if your town has a written IPM that we could get a copy of to give to our local Board of Health. We do not. We do not have any integrated pest management programs here in uh, Sterling, you know, for rodent control. Uh, I'm certainly, I'm certainly sure that we could, I could, I could get a hold of one. I mean, I don't think it'd be that difficult. It's a, it's a pretty straightforward process. We've kind of gone over the, we've kind of gone over the, uh, the essentials of it here in this presentation. So if somebody wants to follow up on that, they could just email you. Absolutely. Okay, Patrick, I'm going to suggest that's your best course of action for right now. Use Gary's email. It's gcmenin, that's M-E-N-I-N, senior, S-R, at comcast.net. Not .com, everyone, that's .net. Um, and let's see, Francis shared with us, don't the poison companies know when they're developing their products that the rat poisons will kill predators? And it isn't probable, and isn't it probable that they probably want to kill raptors so that it's reducing natural predators? I think we did talk about I can't that. Speak, I certainly can't speak for them on that basis. Uh, they, you know, many of the boxes claim if they use your product correctly that it will have minimum secondary poisonings. And of course, we've learned that's not true. Um, you know, they, they, the, the things that the arguments they throw back at me are the arguments that the far more raptors are killed with window kills and road kills and wind turbine kills and many other kills. But and I, I don't know what the data is on that, but you know, this is one thing that we can we can stop. It's hard to you know, hard to stop all road kills. We can do some things in that area. For example, don't throw food out your window when you're riding, riding down the road. Well, what does that do? You throw food out the window, the mice come to eat the food, the raptors come to eat the mice, they get hit by a car. That seems like common sense. <laughs> Um, but also a good reminder, and that was the last of our questions. Um, I do want to share with you that Stephanie wrote in and said, Gary, it is such an honor to have you as a speaker for Wild Care. We are grateful for your expertise and your help sharing this important message that poison is never the answer. You're very welcome. Anytime I can, can do this and I'm willing to share any of these slides if anybody else wants to, you know, be a, uh, be a troubadour of this anywhere, you know, throughout the state or other states. So I will second Stephanie's statement. Thank you so much, Gary. It's been 
wonderful getting to know you a little. It's been amazing learning so much in the last couple of days. Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Again, if you would like to email Gary directly, his information is right there on the screen. We are recording this, so it will be available on our uh, Wild Care YouTube. So if for some reason you need to go back and reference some of this information, it will be on there. You can always find information at raptorsarethesolution.org or you can reach us at wildcarecapecod.org and Stephanie and I are happy to help you. And if we can't, we'll pass your information on to Gary. So thank you so much, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this. I hope it was informative. And Gary, again, thank you so much. And everyone have a wonderful evening. Very welcome.